Our next speaker is Tom Kariakos, class of 2019. Tom is an alumnus of Williams College and the University of Mississippi. He joined the class of 2019 after spending three years teaching and coaching at Meridian High School in Meridian, Mississippi. At RWJMS, he is involved with Hip Hop Promise Clinic and Empower Mentorship Program. Tom is interested in the roles of healthcare and education as upstream effectors of opportunity and achievement. Please help me welcome Tom Kuriakos. No matter what's your role in the medical field, you can likely relate to that common feeling of just not having enough hours in the day to do the things you need to do the way you want to do them, the way you feel they ought to be done. For physicians, this may look like that struggle to find those extra few minutes that it would take to foster a relationship with a patient. For medical students, well, that one is easy. It's a constant struggle to manage a vast amount of information in a way that goes beyond just passing that next test to actually building a base of knowledge that we can use at the next level. So how do we cope? Well, we look at things in terms of our most limited resource, time, and ultimately, we prioritize those things we determine are the most productive, the things that are high yield. Take the example of the standard 15-minute patient encounter. It's often said that a good history will get you your diagnosis 90% of the time. And so we're taught how important it is to engage, to ask open-ended questions, to really listen to our patients. But it's also a reality that there are certain questions that we need to have answered, certain metrics that we need to collect, and a finite 15-minute window in which to do it. The end result is that compact and condensed interview that we practice in OSCEs, on rotation, in residency, and beyond. In the field of medicine, we quickly learn to incorporate the, the high yield mentality into our vocabularies and goal oriented mindsets. It's something that allows us to justify the choices we make in terms of productivity, of getting the most bang for our buck. And it's a mindset that we tend to accept by default. At least, I know I did during my first year of medical school. So what is the high yield mentality? The definition speaks for itself. If yield is a good thing, high yield is even better. And applying high yield principles allows us to make measurable progress toward our goals. Beyond that, we tend to practice the things that lead us to success. And so, over time, we get better at seeing things through the high yield lens, applying the principles more widely and more often. However, today, I'm going to suggest that there's a drawback. I'm going to suggest that strict adherence to the high yield mentality and our tendency to make it our default system of prioritization over time can slowly but surely change our perspectives on things we value and how we pursue them. This is something I began to consider recently, and it's a realization that came from thinking back to a lesson I learned in my life before medical school, specifically from one student in a high school classroom in eastern Mississippi. Okay, go, go, ahead and, uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. <laughs> I, <laughs> my name is Raekwon Davis from Reading High, class of 2016. I'm um, at the University of Alabama. My major is physical education. And uh, uh, what do you play here? Uh, I play defensive tackle. This is Raekwon Davis. You may have seen him on TV this past fall, number 99 for the Alabama Crimson Tide one of the premier young defensive tackles in the nation on arguably the top team in college football this year. One look at him and his stats, and it's clear, he's a beast. A physical specimen with a skill set to match. Even more impressive though, Raekwon is from Meridian, Mississippi, a city of about 40,000 near the Mississippi-Alabama border with more than its fair share of violence, crime, and distractions that act to keep its youth in the poverty that many of them grow up in. In short, he's a success. Someone who we can point to and say, that guy is headed places. But Raekwon wasn't always considered a success. And it's his story that I want to tell you a little bit more about tonight. I first met Raekwon in the time that I spent teaching in Meridian, Mississippi. 
It was August 2013. I was one year out of college and tasked with teaching state-tested biology, a graduation requirement to the lowest quartile of students at MHS. At that point, I had spent the past year building my reputation as Coach K, science teacher and track coach by day, afternoon, and sometimes on into the night. <laughs> I was still relatively new, relatively green, but I was excited about the opportunity that I had in front of me to make a difference. I'm Ray Kwan. Raekwon was a sophomore in my third period class, bringing with him a long history of academic struggle and behavioral issues that had landed him in and out of alternative school for years. Let me try and paint a picture of Raekwon in 2013 for you. In a word, man, that cat was terrible. The first few months of any year at Meridian High involved some tense moments. Students are testing their teacher's limits. And teachers are setting the tone, laying the expectations that they'll hold for the year ahead. With Raekwon, I encountered a couple of these standoffs pretty early on. I still remember meeting Raekwon on that first day of class, greeting him at the door, acutely aware that he towered a solid head, neck, and shoulders above my line of sight. <laughs> Watching him as he took his seat, promptly put his head down, and fell asleep for a solid 50 minutes. After dismissal that day, I tracked down some of my colleagues who had taught him the year before to get the inside scoop. I didn't really get any favorable reviews. He had some genuine academic challenges, which stemmed from his learning disabilities, but beyond that, he had a reputation for being stubborn, unwilling to work, throwing temper tantrums when he didn't get his way. I'll never forget the first assignment I ever gave that class. How I watched him hand it to the girl who sat next to him, take it back from her when it was done, and turn it into me, <laughs> swearing up and down that he had done it himself, that I couldn't prove that the handwriting didn't match. After about a week of this, I let Raekwon know. If he wasn't going to put the work in, he'd end up failing the class. He told me he didn't have to do the work, and that was that. Raekwon had an air about him that suggested that the rules existed, they just didn't apply to him. And this is a mindset that went beyond his size or his status as a football player back to his academic past. As a student with documented learning disabilities, Raekwon received services from the special education department. And over the years, he had come to rely on them as a crutch. See, students with learning disabilities, by law, must be provided with appropriate accommodations. And teachers are responsible for providing proof of those interventions when a student fails. For Raekwon, that meant extra time to turn in assignments, unlimited retakes of tests and quizzes that he failed, modified content so he didn't have to take notes. Now, this sounds reasonable in theory, but the special education system can be tricky to navigate for one student. And when you teach 150 students, most of whom are below grade level, and many who have their own sets of accommodations, it becomes easy to lose track of all those interventions, and especially to fall behind on the paperwork. The end result is that overwhelmed and overworked teachers often end up just passing these students. And in this setting, special education students grow accustomed to expecting to pass, whether they master the content or not. Raekwon fit this mold well. His combination of genuine learning disabilities, his history of seemingly inevitable promotion from grade to grade, and the fact that, despite his size, he was still just a really big kid let him to do whatever he pleased in the classroom, and still expect to pass. For me, that wasn't going to fly. I had come to Mississippi to teach, to hold my students to high standards, to inspire them to success through personal accountability. And with Raekwon, I had my work cut out for me. It's fair to say that when I first met Raekwon Davis, he was the most difficult student in the most difficult class that I taught in my three years in Meridian. That year went by pretty much as you would expect it to. Raekwon skipped, dozed, and generally struggled. I taught my classes, and with a lot of help, made sure that all of his accommodations were provided and that the reams of paperwork that came with it were completed. By the time he realized that he might need to make a change, it was too late. When the end of that school year rolled around, Raekwon had failed the class, failed the state test, and been sent to alternative school as soon as the football season ended. That, I figured, was the last that I had seen of Raekwon Davis. Before I knew it, 
one school year ended and the next began. And on that first day of the next year, you won't believe who I found walking in through my classroom door. Again. <laughs> That's right, Raekwon was back. This time, escorted by his coach, who had put him back in my class specifically because he knew that I would hold him accountable. To be honest, I expected more of the same. But it quickly became clear that that year, something was different. When we worked, he worked. When he and I talked, he listened. When he felt challenged, he actually tried. Now I can tell you all about how hard Raekwon worked at improving his grades that year. But to me, the truest evidence that he had grown, that he had really matured, could be seen in the role that he began to play in my classroom as a leader. That year, whenever those tense moments or standoffs would occur, I found Raekwon stepping up, telling his classmates to chill out, go on and sit down, to just follow directions. <laughs> and they did. Whether off the strength of his reputation as a well-liked peer and football player, or because they knew that he had experienced the consequences of their mistakes firsthand. Of course, it helped that my enforcer was a solid six foot seven. That's him, standing next to a regular-sized high schooler. <laughs> Just to give you a frame of reference. By the end of that year, Raekwon had passed the class, made it past that state test, and was on his way towards earning that Division I scholarship at Alabama. It's fair to say that when I left Meridian in 2015 to start medical school, Raekwon Davis had transformed from one of my most difficult students to one of my all-time favorites. <laughs> one of the brightest success stories from my days in Meridian and a student who I maintain a relationship with to this day. But let's take a step back, hit pause for a second, take it back to our discussion of high yield. This past winter break, I was catching up with Raekwon like I do every month or so. We were talking about the semester that had just passed, laying out the goals and challenges for the one ahead. When I began to think about our own journey together, and I got to thinking, what if, what if, I had applied the same framework of high yield to my time in the classroom. As everyone in this room can imagine, the fields of medicine and education have significant parallels. As a teacher, I too was working with limited resources, both time and effort. As a teacher, I had my larger goals and visions of what education was supposed to be. But consider this, we live in the era of high stakes testing and I was teaching a state-tested subject in a critical needs school district, where everyone from the superintendent to the principals to the faculty on down were under significant pressure to adopt the high-yield mentality, to focus on those students who could contribute to higher test scores. At the district level, the school's accreditation, its annual grade, was tied to test scores. On an individual level, teacher bonuses, also tied to test scores. Now, as a second year teacher, working 80 hour weeks and making a whopping 30K before taxes, <laughs> I had significant pressure from above and incentive from within to go high yield. And if I had applied the high yield model to my time in the classroom, I would have approached that first year with Raekwon very, very differently. On day one, I would have moved him from his front row seat to the very back of the room, giving that spot to another student one who had a better shot of passing the class. Now, I would have provided him his accommodations, but at the end of the day, I probably would have just 65'd him on out, making sure that he passed so that I could save myself the paperwork, but also sparing myself the time and trouble of having to actually teach him so that I could focus my efforts elsewhere on the more high-yield students. I could have written him off, but I didn't, and here's why. Adopting the high yield model in my classroom would have violated every reason that I decided to teach in the first place. My ideas of the right to education, of fairness and equality, of bridging the gap through investing in potential. Now, I won't lie to you, at the end of that first year, when he failed, I had to wonder whether it had all been for nothing. But what has dawned on me since then is that that failure was critical. It was that failure that broke Raekwon out of the expectation of getting something 
for nothing. They showed him the role that he had to play in his own success. And I'll be the first to tell you, there are many, many others who have played larger, more critical roles in Raekwon's story so far. But I do believe that in the time that we spent together, we made each other better. For me, he showed me the importance of investing in all of my students, even the ones who don't seem destined for success. For him, I think I gave him a glimpse of his own potential, of what he's truly capable of. All right, and if you can pick one memory, one memory that you and Coach K share that stands out from the rest, rest of these from all these past three years, what would it be? Um, like we have these talks, of, of like making it like he want to. We have these talks, like he want to see me fall, like he want to see me make it. He want, he don't want to see me in the streets, like he does. He will have these, like the. These, these big talks, cause like we'll have them all time, like, cause I know he want me to make it far. He, he want me to do something big. He want me to have something in my life. He want me to be successful. So he want me to, to be great in life. So what's the point of this talk? Let's start with what it's not. It's not to say that you shouldn't be goal oriented or that you should abandon the concept of high yield altogether. In our field, we need to prioritize. And going high yield helps us do that. But I believe that it is important to recognize that the high yield mentality necessarily reframes our larger goals in terms of measured outcomes. And because it is so prevalent, it has the potential over time to cause us to forget the reasons that we have for being on this journey in the first place. If I had gone high yield with Raekwon, I would have given up on him before I ever even gave him a chance. And the scariest thing is, I would have had myself convinced that I was justified in doing so. If you take something from my talk tonight, I hope you'll recognize the potential that the high yield mentality has to alter your perspectives on the things you value over time. And when you find yourself tempted to default to it, whether it's skipping a lecture because you know it won't be tested, or just running through your checklist as you race from one patient to the next, I hope you'll check yourself. Remember your personal purpose for being here in this field and stay grounded in it. Keep it with you. And finally, remember that there are some investments that may seem unwise or risky in that initial high yield analysis, but that sometimes we're better off for having made those investments after all. I know Raekwon and I would agree. Thank you. <laughs>